everyone, welcome. This is a new feature I'm working on. This is Heroes, Martyrs, and Villains of the First Amendment uh, community. So today we're going to start with this gentleman here. His name is John Peter Zinger. He was a hero uh, to anybody that fights for the Constitution, the First Amendment, and justice. Alright, so this gentleman here, John Peter Zinger, was born in 1697 in Germany. His father is unknown. His mother, his mother was Johanna Zinger. He had a brother and a sister. At the age of 13, the family decided to set sail for New York. While making the journey, his father died, leaving Johanna to care for the family. In 1711, John went to work as an apprentice with a pioneer printer named William Bradford. By 1799, I'm sorry, 1719, he had completed his partnership and also married Mary White, who unfortunately died a short time later. The next year, John relocated to Chestertown, Maryland, where he began working for the Maryland Assembly writing the session laws for the official meetings. After two years of this, he moved back to New York in 1722 he also remarried to an Anna Catherine Mullen, and the following year he became a freeman. By 1726, John was able to start his own business. For seven years, he printed primarily political and religious pamphlets written in Dutch. But in 1730, he printed Arithmetica by Peter Venema. Now, I couldn't find anything on this author. I found like, parts of the book, but it was talking about another author so I I didn't include the guy's name but if you guys want to you guys can go ahead so to me that's really under dispute so if somebody can maybe you know straighten that out for me that would be completely awesome okay so the turning point in the life of Zinger happened in 1733 when he was appointed editor of the New York Weekly Journal a new political paper and that brings us to Governor William Cosby who served from August 1732 until March of 1736. He's known as one of the most oppressive royal governors in British colonial America. He angered New York residents by dismissing Lewis Morris, a well-liked chief justice at the time, and replaced him with James DeLancey, a known Cosby ally. Now, the journal was started by lawyers, merchants, and other citizens who thought Cosby regularly misused the powers of his office and would publish as much. And when he became the editor of the journal, he found himself in opposition to his mentor, Bradford, who published the New York Gazette, which had a lot more kinder things to say about the governor. The first issue of the journal was released on November 5th, 1733. Zinger, who had not yet mastered English, did not write any of the main articles. However, as publisher, he was responsible for the content of the journal. So for about a year after the paper was in existence, you know, just saying it's anti-governor and government-themed things, the New York Council decided to punish Zinger. They ordered the burning of four of the worst examples of the offensive content in the journal. The court officials even went as far as to refuse to carry out the order, so the sheriff had his African slave do the deed. They arrested Zinger, charging him with sedation, seditious libel. They arrested Zinger a few days later and set a bail of 400 pounds with an additional 200 pounds for insurance. Zinger, who cannot pay the bell, was sent to prison. He was held in isolation for a few days. All right, so Zinger's original lawyers were James Alexander and William South. They objected to the legality of the judge's comment, uh, commission and were promptly stricken from the list of attorneys. He had no lawyer now. So Mary Spratt Alexander, a backer of the journal, suggested to her husband James Alexander, that he tried to enlist the talents of his friend, Alexander Hamilton, to defend Zinger and would be out of reach of the influence of the judge. Miss Alexander traveled to Philadelphia and presented Hamilton with the case facts, and he agreed to represent Zinger pro bono. Hamilton immediately left for New York to represent Zinger. During opening arguments, Hamilton argued that jurors were capable of deciding if his client had printed truths or falsehood whose guidance from the judge without guidance from the judge. Naturally, Delancey did not agree and deny the request, saying a judge has more, was more qualified to interpret the law. 
Now, while Hamilton did admit to the court that Zinger had indeed printed and published the articles in question, but brought forth the notion that the truth of facts can be a valid defense, a novel concept at the time. He presented evidence that proved the truth of Zinger's articles, but the judge again rejected the evidence. This, of course, did not stop Hamilton. He appealed to the jury to look at the evidence in their everyday lives to see the truth of what was said. His eloquence of words... His eloquence of words... Uh, let's hear from Hamilton himself. Okay, so here's what Mr. Hamilton said. This is his own account. The question before the court and you gentlemen of the jury is not of small nor private concern. It is not the cause of a poor printer nor of New York alone, which you are now trying. No, it may in its consequence affect every free man that lives under a British government on the main of the America, it is the best cause, it is a cause of liberty, and I make no doubt, but your upright conduct this day will not only entitle you to the love and esteem of your fellow citizens, but every man who prefers freedom to a life of slavery will bless and honor you as men who have baffled the attempt of tyranny, and by an impartial and uncorrupt verdict have laid a noble foundation for securing to ourselves our posterity for all future generations and our neighbors that to which nature and the laws of our country have given us a right the liberty both of exposing and opposing arbitrary power in these parts of the world at least by speaking and writing the truth and then of course the chief justice the judge said who left his final um comments to the jury gentlemen of the jury the great pains mr hamilton has taken to show how little regard juries are to pay to the opinion of the judges and is insisting so much upon the conduct of some judges and trials of this kind is done no doubt with a design that you should take but very little notice of what i may say upon this occasion i shall therefore only observe to you that as the facts or words and information are confessed the only thing that can come in question before you is whether the words as set forth in the information make a libel and that is a matter of law no doubt in which you may leave to the court and then Zinger's account of what happened with after the jury is. So the jury withdrew and in a small time returned and being asked by the clerk whether they were agreed of their verdict and whether John Peter Zinger was guilty of printing and publishing libels in the information mentioned, they answered by Thomas Blunt, uh, Blunt their foreman, not guilty. Upon which there were three huzzahs, huzzah, you know, those were shots of acclaim, in the hall, which was crowded with people, and the next day I was discharged from my imprisonment. Now that's just one of those things that makes you feel good that, you know, the court can work. It doesn't always work, but it can. And it's evidence here that, you know, Hamilton was able to just really, you know, get the truth out there and you know the fact that we take advantage that you know the truth is a defense back in the day it wasn't that is baffling to me i had no idea before reading about this that that was the case that is baffling to me it's like you know how much power they had and you know it just really reaffirms the fact that they will try to take advantage of you know any opportunity they can so it is very important to fight for First Amendment rights. I will never say that there shouldn't be First Amendment auditors. There shouldn't be people that do this sort of thing. I, my only argument is there's a way to do it and there's a way not to do it. We have to encourage dialogue. You know, this was take it to the higher courts, you know, do what you have to do. Calling officers shitheads and, you know, all that stuff isn't going to do anything. It might make you feel good. It might get a couple of laughs on the internet. <coughs> Excuse me. But, you know, in the long run, it's not really going to accomplish a whole lot of much. Um, so I'll just leave you with that. And uh, if you have any comments or if, you know, if you want to uh, talk about maybe some of you guys have, you know, dealt with some First Amendment issues yourself, go ahead and you can talk about it in the comments. Or maybe if you want to talk about somebody else who you know of, because, I mean, there's a lot that I don't know about, you know, the history of, you know, people who fight for the first amendment and i'm you know i'm learning and i would like to learn some more so if anyone has anybody that they would like to uh bring up let me know you know i'll do some research or i'll look it up maybe i'll make a video maybe i won't um but that's what we do so this is all about heroes martyrs and uh 
villains. I think next time I'll do a martyr. Uh, and then I'll do a villain and we'll just keep going like that, I think. So uh, I just hope you guys have a great weekend. And uh, let's, let's just make sure we keep not only the, account, uh, the auditors accountable, but let's keep our public officials accountable as well because they are not above the law and they definitely need to be put in their place when they need to be put in their place. So I hope everyone, like I said, has a great day and uh, hope you enjoyed the video. Please like, share, subscribe, and uh, see you next time.